Hello ladies and gentlemen, Dave Dobbs here. It's the 11th of April 2022 and um, as you know there's been, as, as you may know, there's been some major sightings of a twin tail object and this sighting here. Um, this was two days before the big sighting that everyone's talking about. So the sighting everyone's talking about is um, ominous clouds seen over Alaska sparks conspiracies. What the what's the um, official explanation? Well, that is um, still unknown. Um, but it was seven o'clock in the morning on the seventh of April, <coughs> um, or seven sixteen in the morning on the seventh of April. Um, and then, when you go to, um, I put um, that into Facebook and came up with that sighting. But what was very interesting was that um, Patty Anderson um, had also said a few days before this, we saw a strange thing go across the sky from um, from Name to Fairbanks. So that's from east to west. What an amazing shot. Um, just to bring you to my model, Let's just put that over there and let's just come to, um, so that's going back obviously um, 1800 years to, um, well 262 there is um, is where the downfall of Rome and when we were right next to the system as we are now. Notice that from here it's above the ecliptic plane, this system, Pluto, whatever you want to call it, is above the ecliptic plane and this is its crossing point. And this is also a crossing point. This will be when it's below the ecliptic plane. And um, so we're going to go um, forward. Um, notice when the systems are moving each, moving uh, away from each other and now they're completely on the opposite side. A thousand years ago and then they start getting closer and closer to Galileo's time. And this is very interesting because 1606 um, was when we had the big tsunami here in um, the West Country and possibly a much bigger tsunami than we're actually realising. And then 84 years later we get Isaac Newton and then pretty much 84 years later we get, you know, William Herschel and Uranus and then Neptune and, you know, and then we're getting the, Ca the Carrington event in, in 1859 and then we're going to come up to the discovery of Pluto in 1930 and um, and then we're coming to our time here which is back to the 262 time which is we're reoccurring and we're seeing everything that played out in 262 occur now and this is what I talk about and so if we look at this if we go from um, 2004 or well, 1998 which is um, when Carlos Rada basically predicted it would come back in and we go to um, and we come up to 2004, which is when I've done the in-depth flybys of looking at what that really looks like to now. Let's come to, we see 2010, 2011. Now remember in 2010, when Kerberos and Sharon came by, um, the crossing, even though I've got it coming from south to north here, in reality it came from north to south, but I've kept all these objects on the same inclination. Uh, going through this because simply I did, wasn't advanced enough to um, show the inclinations um, going from um, from north to south. So I kept them all on the same just to try and keep give you that motion and I have to kind of, you know, we're understanding that this whole system is, is moving now from north to south or, or what it seems to be north to south. So it could be argued it's going from south to north also and it's, there's, I'm not totally fixed on that inclination at all. I'm not totally fixed on any of this model. This was to try and bring all of the motions, 1800 years of motions, and to show you what that would look like in in one big model and to also try to see if we could calculate what would happen from 2020 up to 2023. And so this model has really been to um, accommodate that. So, you know, in 2010, like I say, we saw the big earthquake in, uh, well, we saw the big volcano going off in Iceland on the, on the, 20, um, on the 26th of February 2010. And then 27th, we saw the massive earthquake in 
Chile. So we're going from north to south in a single day, the whole process, or in a couple of days, the whole process was over and done with. Now because of what we saw in, in now because of what we saw in, well let's go forward now to, even though we're keeping these on the same inclination, we can also, we can see that um, we come back to um, 2022 and we can see that the same two objects are coming back round for their big flybys except that now what's happening is earth is running parallel to them they're actually coming in from the north going towards the south we're running parallel with them so we can see that <clears throat> we are going to begin some long duration volcanic um, occurrences now and and then next year we have the same thing going on again um, with these two flybys because this year is the repeat of what happened in 2010 and next year what happened in 2011 in March 2011 Fukushima it's like, like I say this is not moving directly from north to south, this is all coming in on the ecliptic. Do you remember Kilauea going off on May the fourth, two thousand and eighteen, and it went off for six weeks. Then the and then and then from then on, since that time, we've been getting long duration volcanoes like what happened last year, the beginning of around about March. Um, the Icelandic volcano went off for months, right up till nearly August, well, August, and then. La Palma just after that begins and goes off right from um, um, what do you call it um, from August September to um, for four months and that was the object that was causing that was um, this one here um, what I call Europa um, that's what caused that that the and now we come into um, the next ones. You know, there's ultimately there's five objects that are coming in towards our sun and back out from the Pluto system. And five objects means that ten fly by because what comes in has got to go out. And so you will probably have um, have noticed that um, that there's just been 27,000 tremors that have recorded in the Azores. And the reason I showed you the long term, um, the, 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 the long flyby that I just showed you, the reason I showed you that, yes, yeah, so the reason I showed you this model was when I mentioned the 1606 um, tsunami that we don't know how big it was. What earthquakes and volcanoes were specifically going bang around 1606 to 1608? Remembering that this is also 1582 was when the Catholics changed the clocks and they moved basically, they deleted they deleted not only just one year but they virtually deleted they deleted quite a few days as well but you can imagine that our, when this whole system goes above the ecliptic from below the axis of our earth changes slightly and our seasons change also so it's quite an interesting time to change it although they obviously they didn't just delete one year they actually deleted the 13th month as well so when we went from the julian calendar to the gregorian calendar it was specifically at this point where there was going to be marginal changes in in our access because this was going to be moving above and we can see that as this goes past us over here um there's going to be there's going to be another change it's going to kind of alter potentially back to where it was before it entered here and so we could see big changes in our seasons as a result of that slight inclination. But what do you think was the volcanoes that went bang that caused that tsunami? I mean, there's the there's the 
there's what we're told is you know we're given this kind of like this map as our kind of like as our understanding of where the plate divide between the um, Eurasian plate up here and the African plate down here and this runs up to the Azores down here but isn't it interesting that last year we had the earthquake here in La Palma and would it surprise you if that fault line dropped down here and that dropped down the coast and was actually coming up here. Um, that's where the Azores is on officially on the map. That's where La Palma is on the map. You can see how how um, you know it's it, it's a tricky one to um, to define. That's where the you know when the big Congo earthquake happened before, and it happened um, somewhere um, between the Congo and I'm assuming Tanzania, um, somewhere around here, um, and then that fault line ca carries on up. And if we look at that fault line again, that fault line where the earthquake occurred, this this is obviously the um, Well, that's interesting because that must be the that must be the Indian plate. Mm, that's a bit confusing because that's calling that the Indian plate. So I'm not too sure what that plate, or is that the Indian Ocean? I'm always assuming that that's the Indian plate going up against the um, African plate there, and then that plate line comes. Um, comes up there and divides it and hits up against the Eurasian plate but that's a little bit confusing as well but we know that there was a massive volcano here that went off at the same time as the Icelandic um, volcano don't we uh, around about March last year and it did the same thing at the same time it did that Etna did the same thing the magma rose to the top of the caldera the walls collapsed and all the magma ran down the side and now there's a new high higher caldera you know um in with um with etna you know and that's um you know that's the, you know etna's kind of classic for your kind of strombolian kind of like uh which is you know etna's next to stromboli um you know stromboli um well is it stromboli Strom, Strom, stromboli vol volcano and that's the characteristic of both etna and um and stromboli Stromboli and kind of that's kind of like um that's not kind of what they call pyroclastic flows generally coming down the side like we saw with the Volca like that we saw with Iceland last year and like we saw with um La Palma. That's um pyroclastic flows are big fast moving flows that run down the side and um and Strombolian is kind of like an eruption where you're throwing boulders and magma, but um, they're not coming out that far. You know, when we saw um, earlier this year, earlier this year we saw um, we saw um, Etna release magma super high. You know, it went seven and a half miles into the sky. And you think about that. That's a massive eruption. That's like eighty million tons of magma going up. And yet no one is running to get out of the way. If you were to throw 80 million tons of rocks above your head, your chances of survival, you know, would be quite limited. But actually what's happening when 80 million tons of rock goes above your head from a volcano, um, it burns off into mostly carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and it's not coming back down. It consumes all the oxygen above as it just burns itself off and turns into gas and um, mostly gas and these tiny silica beads which then all the moisture condenses on that is coming up from the oceans and um, and causes massive storms and um, so when we see kind of this kind of activity going along in various different forms along this line and suddenly we're seeing We're seeing the Azores go back. We're seeing what could potentially be um, 
a massive um, potential for um, you know that whole fault line. So let's look at what happened in 1606. Flooding in Velas, Sal, Sal George, Sal George. I don't know if that's that's uh, Roger, as they might say. I'm not too sure, but um, in February caused large damages to the town of Velas or Valais. Many roads were the way the way that no one could walk a foot. 1608, large flooding in Angra to Syria, or however, however you pronounce that, on February 11th. About nine at night and created a huge intense mudslide. Um, now we know in the big volcano that's that's um, that's starting to erupt in Colombia that in um, I think in the in the eighties, eighty five, eighty six killed lots of people, caused a mud flood, but that was caused because of snow on top of the mountain. Or on top of the volcano, it melted and brought all the mud down afterwards. Now, are these volcanoes high enough to be snow capped to create a mudslide? Because if it wasn't a mudslide that, that did all the damage there, could it not be that just like in when before before the tsunamis that hit um, hit in 1606, you know, that was all Glastonbury was a port, and then this big tsunami came in and um, what well, took. 10 days to come in and 10 days to go out. One could arguably call, call it the tide also. And, um, and it came in slowly and then it brought the mud down from above the port and filled up what is now the Glastonbury levels with the mud from the surrounding hills, which reclaimed pretty much the port of the, 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 the Sea of Avalon was now the the levels, the Somerset levels, and um, we see massive evidence of that here with this video. Anyway, so just there's the, one of the caves that was um, when the mud floods after the mud floods. Um, you know the whole areas of the land were washed away. And this was this cave was revealed in the in, in the Azores. Um, look at the shots of the Azores. Look what it looks like. It looks like volcano. What does that look like? What can we expect to happen here? And then we look at um, the nineteen oh no the nineteen oh eight Messina. Even though we say eighteen oh eight was the last time that we say. You know, officially, 1808 was the last time um, the Azores really went bang. That we record a big kind of like occurrence in, in but actually, 1908, the Messina earthquake, also known as um, the the Regio 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 uh, earthquake, occurred on the 28th of um, December in Sicily, and um, Calabria, Calabria. I'm not too sure how to pronounce that, but southern Italy, um, 7.1 um, but it was also a tsunami um, were also completely destroyed um, 75,000 and 82,000 lives were lost it was the most destru destructive um, earthquake ever to strike Europe But when we look at, if we look at the activity that was going on in um, 1907, an underwater eruption at the at the Monaco fracture, 1911, underwater eruption at the Monaco fracture, it caused a minor eruption located two to three hundred. Now we see that as oh, that's nothing to do with that. But remember, this is that same fault line and. You know, the 1907 um, San Francisco earthquake, massive. Where is the Monaco fault line? Um, the Monaco Bank volcano line here. The Azores here. This is all the same area. This is all the same time. We see massive 
earthquakes and massive tsunamis that take massive volumes of lives. It's not, you're not looking at La Palma, you're looking at La Palma and all the way this fault line down here. You know, you've got to try and get your perspective of what sits above that fault line. To understand that when water bottlenecks into here, you know, you'll see, you need to see, you know, when was the last time La Palma went back? Really big. It was in Galileo's time. Around, you know, 50, late 1500s, you know, 16, you know, but around Galileo's time, when we were, said we discovered the first dwarf planet ever discovered. Then 84 years later, you know, Isaac Newton, 84, 84 years, years later, you know, William Herschel, then 84 years later, Neptune, and then 84 to year, four years later, Pluto. Every time you're like, oh, Uranus looks like Jupiter. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Except it's kind of blue. And then, you know, Neptune comes along and says, oh, it looks like Uranus a little bit. Yeah, stripy and blue. Amazing. 84 years later, it's just like, oh, don't tell me. Dwarf planet, blue, Pluto, of course, not, yeah, of course, I get it, yeah, okay, I've got it. You know, it, it, it's like we are in this story um, that is that is the fault line. That you need to be concerned about. How long will the Azores go bang for? Well, the Azores is likely to go bang now because these, this shot, and this object, um, remember this shot that Brandon Corey Nagley posted on the 11th of March 2000 and, um, this year, 2022, the pair coming in. How many shots have I showed you of the pair over the years? So many. We've seen so many shots of the pair coming in. You know, caught by many different, um, caught by many different channels. You know, Area 55 has caught the, caught those quite a few times. Um, it's, um, and then we had. Um, all of these shots in February um, 2018 and you know you 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 can kind of see this and and um, you know and if I play that hopefully you know that was the um, planet X system comet asteroid object one of the many of planet X systems circulating the earth um, the sun and the sun daily caught over I mean I don't think you know that looks to you like it's going really really fast coming down but that's the same object being caught here and picture if we come back to um, if we come back to this flyby here and we come up to um, 2000 and where we are now um, seeing these objects coming in obviously that like I say the inclination is is wrong on these it's been set only to one thing all the way through this but now they're coming in just above us and coming and they're going to come out the bottom and they're crossing now this is going to be this is going to be like four months this time this is going to be longer than last year this is going to which wherever it starts and it's looking like it's going to be the Azores and imagine that all the oceans that are being pulled up higher up here because these objects are both above us. This is two objects. You're seeing two objects at the same time there. Um, so it's very confusing. You're seeing the bigger one that's coming in that's affecting us year, the, the, this year. And, um, and, and this object is going to be bigger with us next year. This is going to be the Fukushima one for next year. Um, and when these cross the ecliptic, these are coming in, you know, these objects, all of these, the Sharon and what I call um, Kerberos, you know, um, which is named after the planets that um, the, the moons of Pluto. Um, 
and Sharon was the biggest one that was named by um, by Robert Harrington. Um, who was also the biggest influence of Zakai Sitchin on the 12th planet. You know, Harrington worked for the government. Um, and he was, you know, I was going to say Manuel Velaskowski. Um, Zakai Sitchin was a was a, lingu a linguist and a and a, and a historian. He wasn't so much an, an an astronomer. He relied on people like Robert Harrington, who fed him this idea that it was all orbiting the sun. But he was obviously massively influenced by Carlos Ferrado, who made the biggest prediction and put his money on the line. Like I put my money on the line and give you absolute predictions, like to tell you that the Azores is about to go off for four months, and could very potentially end in or be the precursor for a tsunami, a big tsunami. And, you know, I wrote a book to say that, to say that Britain was about to be used as a Trojan horse by all of that which wants to feed Europe into a war with Russia and Iran and ultimately China. And to use that as the, as the ground to, to, to that is, you know, offer Europe as, if you like, the sacrifice to reinstate the hegemony of the US dollar and to hide us behind this big front of technology. And that technology primarily is, you know, when you see uh, kind of our rockets destroying Russian, Russian tanks and they don't hit the tanks, they just go over the top of the tank and then they blow up above the tank and they melt the tank from above. You know, if you were to use an acetylene burner and try and melt through a tank, um, you yeah, you could do it, but you'd need a lot of heat and you'd have to apply it for a little while. Okay, it's very hot and you would get there, but, you know, there's a certain amount of time. But to melt a tank in the, in, in, in a shell that's travelling faster than the speed of, light, uh, speed of sound, to go over the top, and the moment it's above the top, to detonate at that point and melt the top of the tank, you're talking about... You're talking about a certain type of fuel, a certain type of shell that can release so much energy that you have to assume that it's depleted uranium. You have to assume that most of the technology that's being used, you know, when the chieftain or whatever they were, what do we call our, 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 our most, our most ad advanced tanks? They're, don't they? they're called chieftains anymore. I think they're something like Challenger and the Challenger 2 that you know, that can destroy Russian tanks with it from a six mile distance. And the Russian tanks can only defend once they are within a four mile distance. So it, you wonder why many of the Russians abandon their tanks when a, um, when Ukrainian technology, current technology is within six mile distance they have to get four mile distance and once they start striking us at six miles they've got to run because they, they're fighting a computer system they're fighting a depleted uranium bombshell that doesn't even have to hit them and now these new kind of missiles these javelin missiles that the britain is supplying which doesn't even need to hit the <clears throat> the aircraft it only has to detonate near the aircraft and if it's a helicopter it will just snap it in two you know, you're, you know, when I wrote Laughing Gas, I was seeing, I was shown all this in a vision. And I was told that this, if you start this war, you, it will not be Russia that finishes it. You are up against, because this war, once it started, will, will annihilate this world. You will lose control over, over it. The technology you will leash on the table will annihilate it. And this is all just to underpin a currency that has no value. And because you're not willing to give it any value, you would rather fight rather than put real value on the table, you would rather take the whole world into war. And that's what this is all about. You know, the, the barrier between the Ukraine, Europe and Russia is all about the gas being worth eight times more on one side of the border than the other. And so we're fighting for economic supremacy here. That's what this is about. Remember what, who removed the value of gold from, who took gold away? Remember who won the election in 1968? A black man. 
a black man. Um, Dick Gregory, the 1968 one president elect, and uh, all the computers tabulated him as the winner. And then the next day, you see on the front cover of the newspapers that some computer systems can't be trusted, like the one that elected, that, that tabulated the results and come up with Dick Gregory as the winner, not Richard Nixon. And Richard Nixon, they took his votes, they gave them to Richard Nixon. And Richard Nixon promptly sent those boys that had voted off to Vietnam and promptly got rid of the gold standard. And by getting rid of the gold standard, because remember France was already saying they want their gold repatriated because it was now all dollars and absolutely no sense. So they just dug the hole so much bigger and they, um, they got rid of the gold standard completely, which was meant it was completely fiat-based speculative currency, which meant the only value was if you don't use this, we're going to kill you. Look at what happened with Saddam Hussein. Look at what happened with kind of like with Gaddafi trying to bring the gold dinar. Look what's happening with China now. They've opened up their new gold-backed currency. You know, it's um, it's all happening, and all these countries are standing in opposition, saying we will not deal and we won't trade with you if you're not going to bring real value to the table. And we're not going to bring real value. The real value we're bringing to the table is these missiles. It's this perpetual war that says, actually, you know, you will use our dollars and you will use our pounds or you will die horribly. And this is an unfair equation because there seems to be technology coming in from somewhere that seems to be all about the equalizer. And what I wrote in Laughing Gas, I didn't understand the nature of what it was. I always wanted to know what the war was. You know, Laughing Gas starts with what, you know, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, Humpty Dumpty had a, a great fall. You know, four score men and four score more could not place Humpty where he was before. And, you know, we all think, oh, Humpty Dumpty's also doing with the big cannon that fell off and, and, um, and but actually it was about, you're either on one side or on the other side. You can't be in the middle. If you're middle, you're enemy to both. So yeah, we can see it was the academy, but it was also a, a message. You know, it came out at the time of the, the, the civil war in, in England, you know, the roundheads and the cavaliers, you know, the, the parliamentarians against the royalists, however you want to call it, it was you were divided into two camps, just like Brexit and Europe, just like, just like we see divide and conquer, and how this whole division. And I said, if you are, if you leave Europe, your fate is sealed. You will be facing because of what will happen then, and because of the drive to take over the world. You're going to walk away from Europe and ensnare the world into this new economic free trade deal where you lose all sovereignty and you are completely and utterly fracked on every level, shape and form. This is the scenario that I've told you. Now, the only way out of this is the situation is complete economic collapse. Peacefully, you stop this whole pro process. We stop this whole process or we we go under the wheels of this now. We can see what's going to happen. We can see these flybys are now clearly coming in, exactly as I told you. You know, if we um, now go back to the, um, this is just the flybys and some of the overlays of all the different flybys from 2004 to 2000 and, um, and and basically now, well, this one's this mod, this particular aspect of this model, as I've built on, on this section with the overlays, just runs up to um, 2020, which is when I built this model to try and and this is was a massive upgrade to finally be able to show you. You see, if you if you um, when you start seeing how how the how they how they've all. Matt Rogers fame. We haven't seen Matt, much from Matt Rogers just lately and, and missing his videos massively and his and his his amazing take on things and love you so much Matt. Imagine that shot, you know, that that shot that just came in reminded me so much of that shot you caught on the 15th of August 2016 and it also reminded me of the, you remember the really famous shot also that I post, posted many times, that shot there is, it's also just the same as that on the uh, in um on the 23rd of october 2013 over australia except that now it's coming in from the north not the south because it's all changing remember that's a different object 
that's what I call um, Europa coming in. There's five objects ultimately, and that's Europa coming in. And um, you know, the big one, obviously, that put me on the map was. I mean, that was a massive one because it had come in exactly when I said, "Look out for it." And that Matt Rogers posted it. It was just like, "Oh my god." And um, do you remember I predicted that earthquake to the day and said, listen, you know, and showed you the model. It wasn't, it was still looking at it from a, when I was, the model I was running then was still a heliocentric model. But um, I was desperately trying to work out and people were saying, you're mad, it can't be, your model can't be my, work, work like that. And they were right, my model couldn't work like that. And I had to eventually upgrade to this model. But it was, um, it was that flyby that put me on the map. That was a massive one. And obviously that that shot there, which came in from Dill Martin, and um, that was the last video he posted. Really, he was just so blown apart that even with that sighting, that people just could not break out of their belief systems. But then he was so locked into a belief system because it was like Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, and and yeah, we called it Jesus, I guess. You know, but it just sways. And then do you remember I turn up into America on the day of the big flyby and I said, you can't tell me you're not going to see this. It's going to be amazing. And I turn up in America for that flyby. And that was the really famous shot that um, Relentless Maverick caught, um, caught, Bobby caught. Amazing shot, you know, and you've seen so many shots as, as, as you know, this is only a fraction of them. And then, of, of course, Killer Way went off, like I say, on May the 4th. And then... Then we had the big kind of volcano going off on the moon, and then we lost the we lost, and we we literally watched the object coming right past the oh, sorry from Mars. <clears throat> saw volcanoes going off on Mars and everything else like that, and we're just like guys. We saw the object swing straight past Mars, and then we lose the rover because in a, in a, in a dust storm, and then we see volcanoes going off literally as this object goes past Mars, and then we get the big sighting in in. Um, in in June the June the seventeenth two thousand eighteen and it blew me away and my and it was just like how because my model and I have to upgrade to this model up here and and to say guys I still can't fully understand this but we're in a flux because how can this be on both sides how can this be right there and how come and it caused this big divide that I started coming up you know it was two thousand eighteen it was it was the it was the no it was first it was the first of September two thousand nineteen that Alex Luhan came up with the really the crazy shot that I don't know if he's on this, but um, but it it was the it was basically the shot of shots that um, I don't know if I've got it there. No, I haven't got it there. I'm afraid on this one. Normally I always show you, don't I? But it might come up in one of the videos here if I see it. But that's kind of close to the time. These were some of the shots that you know. Same thing happened with Steve Olson, one of the most amazing video makers, and covered more of it. And when he posted these shots, he got so attacked. And um, and we knew it was coming in. We could see it, um, but we we couldn't believe it. And now we come to the there's the pair again. That was um, Area Fifty Five, I think. And um, and we haven't even got to the kind of like uh, we haven't even got to the July August period when all these objects that are coming in now and are running next to us are going to start going out the other side. We've got a hell of a year this year. We've got a hell of a year to um, get through. We've got um, this is just beginning. Remember that I said that twenty seventh, twenty eighth of February was when it last affected us in the big flyby that happened in 2010 and um, and when when did we um, I'm just trying to think when the um, when the Fukushima earthquake occurred in 2022 the one recently um, it would have been March Full moon is the 18th of March, so it's going to be around there. It was just before the, it was like 16th of March, and um, caused a lot of damage. A few people died, but it wasn't as big as what I said. But remembering that this whole flyby is not happening in two days. It's happening in five months. It's not boom, straight through. It's, 
it's coming in just below us. You know, this, when we see this, when, when we um, see that, this thing, this is not just flying by us, it's super fast. This object moves around. You know, every time we go around, this, around the sun once in 365 days, this goes around what is orbiting and comes into our sun and goes back, what does one complete loop of its rotation in 11 twelfths of that time. So when we go around once, um, or when we go around 12 times around the sun, it will do 11 complete loops. So it's falling slightly short, it's always dropping back. One Canada month, a month every year. And we've observed that. We've observed, we've observed that since 2010, 11. And other objects move slightly faster. <clears throat> but they're all in this kind of like band, in this kind of, in this kind of, in this kind of interesting framework. And so this object is not just boom, straight, straight, straight past us. It doesn't mean it's going slower because its circumference is bigger. And so when we come really close to us, it is traveling faster. But I call this aspect of the flyby, as I named it in 2018, Asteroid Alley. Because of all the objects that come close to us when we, when we are close to the tail at this point, and this big object now has been sitting behind us, the one that I'm talking about, the one that caused the 2010, it came up behind us, Area 55, caught amazing shots of it. He's caught amazing shots of it, let me just go to his videos. But he posted this shot um, that one month ago, and um, almost like showing like a pair on there, but um, he posted that shot there um, a month ago, an amazing shot. And it looks like it's coming in, it's gonna go straight behind us, it's going straight past us, but it's coming in behind us. It's not, it's traveling slightly faster than us, but you can imagine that when we get next to it, it's actually traveling faster, faster than us, but actually it's overall circumference because it's so much bigger, it is traveling faster than us, but it takes longer to do complete rotation and therefore it always drops back but when we come in right next to each other it will ultimately be traveling faster than us and you can imagine again if we come back to here you can imagine as we come round here you can imagine if we're to assume that well, this is Kerberos in this time, you know, we, we, it's difficult for me to tell which is which when we're next to them and which is the one, which is the first, you know, I, I, I name them because of, because of their history and because of, because of different kind of like uh, uh, different accounts of them in our past. Um, but you can imagine that they've got the asteroids in their tail here. They have, they're very little, if they come close to us, they've got very little escape velocity. They're going to come in and go back out. They're just going to come next to us and they're going to come so close to our atmosphere, they're going to start burning up. They're going to break up into small parts. And you saw the Indian um, asteroid that came through just a matter of a, a week ago. And it did just like, you know, when they said, oh, you know, Elon Musk lost a load of his... Um, his satellites, his Starlink satellites, they look exactly the same as what came in over is India. And you know, you see um, Nick Thomas is also showing an amazing shot of an asteroid that came in yesterday and it's filled up, it just turned night to day and you see the asteroid and it does not like a shooting star shooting out. It comes in above and you see it dropping straight down and straight through. There's no escape, escape velocity. If something big was to come in now, it would have very little escape velocity. It probably wouldn't even punch through the crust of this planet and go into the magma below. It would likely just dollop down on the planet wherever it landed you know it would lose a lot of debris you know it would start off as if it was going to make a um, transit but it would just get too close to the earth and then start generating too much heat but it wouldn't have enough heat and enough speed 
to burn up. It could potentially break up, but you know we are in a perilous times. We've got um, we've got an enormous amount of time, and you can, I'm afraid, you can see why they're about to fire up the Large Hadron Collider now. You know they're all they're all rebuilt, ready for the next big um, the next big um, the next big collisions. And we don't know how many um, TeV um, trillion electron volt they're going to be. Whether you know, I remember when it was fourteen trillion electron volts. I remember when they started this with one trillion electron volt volts, and they've got it up to their eleven thousand cycles per second around their twenty-seven kilometer long ring, and they'd very quickly got it to eleven thousand cycles a second. 99.99% of the speed of light we rapidly got it up to. So what happens when they put 14, and we don't know how many times more, trillion electron volts through that system to accelerate those things when they can't go any faster? Where do we see? You can't create or destroy energy. So if the speed has reached 99.9% of the speed of light, Where's that energy going to be in that large hadron collider? Where is all that energy going if those particles can't move faster than the speed of light and they couldn't move faster than the speed of light? Pretty much when they began this experiment on the 10th of the 9th of the 8th, 10th of the 9th of the 8th. Yeah, when, you know, the irony is what they're telling you there. They're trying to create what happened to prove that the Big Bang was created by a Big Bang. What are they really trying to create? What are they, what is happening now that they need to create war in Europe right at that point to make that large hydron, hadron collider do its thing specifically when we are coming up to this massive flyby? Why do they need all that war? Why does it have to happen in Europe? Why is Europe catalyst for this war at this point why does Europe why did I write a book to say that Europe will be used as Britain is will be used as the Trojan horse to feed Europe into a war to sacrifice Europe by forcing it to take on these toxic weapons you know, where does the depleted uranium come from that they use in these weapons? You know, our whole carbon dioxide story where we see Etna, you know, just one eruption. You remember, we've seen 52 volcanoes spewing over the last three months. You know, we're seeing major volcanic activity, major flooding all around the globe, major stuff going on that we're just sweeping under the carpet. We're seeing the push for 26 new nuclear power stations in Britain so we can go to carbon zero. Bill Gates, his famous carbon zero, that through vaccinations we can get the earth to carbon zero. And we're seeing how carbon dioxide is essential. You know, if you added water to a planet and you left it, nothing would happen. The water would just sit there. It's only when you add carbon dioxide the two carbonic acid molecules with three atoms of oxygen in each molecule, the carbon dioxide mixed with water, three atoms, two, th two atoms get either side, or is it three atoms? Two atoms get either side, six atoms of oxygen effectively can pull in those two molecules of um, carbonic acid, can pull the calcium out of the bedrock and dissolve the bedrock. We are walking rocks. When someone says you're a rock, you are a rock. You're a walking rock. You are made of rock. You're literally walking rock that has been dissolved by carbon dioxide mixing with water, producing calcium bicarbonate. When the calcium is taken out, the kingpin that holds it all together, and then all of those minerals. The salts, the moon makes the sea salty. It lifts and drops and it lifts and it drops the oceans. It creates the waves. The waves capture the carbon dioxide. That makes carbonic acid, the water into carbonic acid. It dissolves the rock. 
The rock dissolves into the water and creates all that is essential for life. So carbon dioxide, the 0.04 carbon dioxide that's present in our atmosphere with all of these volcanoes. When just Etna goes bang, it's five times more carbon dioxide than probably the entire European block produces in five or ten years in terms of carbon dioxide by one volcano that contributes to our 0.04% carbon dioxide, which has sent the world assy crazy, where we've all got to go and buy a brand new car which consumes a hundred times more fuel, and it's mostly coal and nuclear in its manufacture, but it, produces, it consumes a hundred times more fuel in its manufacture to save you that little tiny more percent, and you have to go and work crazy to get your brand new car that's inbuilt with all this inbuilt obsolescence to save the world, to get us down to carbon zero. Or you have to back nuclear power stations built on tsunami hotspots and fault lines. Chernobyl and Fukushima went bang on the day of massive earthquakes. And you're told you need to back this nuclear agenda. What, why do we need all this depleted uranium? What are we perpetuating when we agree that we want to be carbon zero? We're going to put carbon dioxide and demonize it. Where, what are we walking into in this process? What is subverting humanity? Why are we doing this? Why are we choosing to ignore what volcanoes going off in the Azores mean? And when can we expect them to start going bang? Let's have a look at the um, we're in April, first quarter. Well, we've just seen um, the Azores going bang in the first quarter, and that's a very interesting time. We see the object directly above us. We watched it coming in. We know every part of its movement. Absolutely. Mm. Full moon on the 16th of April. So, how big will the first eruption be? That is likely when the volcano will start spewing. And this is going from the north to the south, which means that the whole planet could shift as this drops. Um, as I say, as this drops from north to south, so the oceans will shift a little bit. This is going to put um, a lot of pressure on. You know, this is going to be not just the oceans moving from north to south and a whole change. The whole planet is going to. Um, you know, understand that, you know, when we get the full moon and, and it's directly between the sun and the earth, uh, sorry, or the new moon, uh, when it's directly between the sun and the earth and the full moon, when it's, it's on the far side of the earth to the sun, but it, it's in alignment. We see these, we see the effects it has on the oceans increase, even though it's distance, even though the moon's distance from the earth hasn't changed. So we can see that when things come onto the ecliptic plane and when they come then into the alignment between the Earth and the Sun, we get these big fluctuations in the amount of energy that is, or the gravity levels in on our planet seem to change. And something seems to pull on the magma of the Earth much more effectively when they come onto the ecliptic plane. That's when the magma starts constantly flowing. It's not like some CME where the magma's got excited and spews constantly, uh, and spews a surge, you know, a kind of like a big high altitude eruption. This is, this is different. These are long duration volcanoes we are experiencing now, which is telling us that all of these objects are now coming onto the ecliptic plane, which is telling you that this whole system that is coming is also approaching the ecliptic plane, which means that after this, it will be below the ecliptic plane. This is when the whole Earth's axis will shift a little bit. We're going into the big shift now. 
which quite which way it's all going to go. Could this bring a massive ice age to certain parts of the globe? Will it change the levels at which ice is occurring? You know, it's there's so much that is going on now. There's so many unknowns. But we can see that we are about to get four months of intense volcanoes as we come into the densest part of this transit now. Remember, this is all of the objects going forward here. This is Pluto, whether you want to call it Pluto, whether you want to call it Uranus, whether you want to call it Neptune. You know, this big blue object that we rename every 84 years. It's going forward in this direction. Our sun is going forward in this direction. When these objects are coming round and then they get pulled into our sun. You know, this for these objects, that's their perihelion point. And helium, helium implies, implies the sun because of it, helium going into, I'm assuming, hydrogen even though that might not be exactly true. Maybe that's not the origin of why we, the helio aspect of why we call the sun helio. But we can see that this object, that these objects orbit, this thing doesn't spew photons. It's not hydrogen going into helium. A helium, it's, it's, It's spewing iron, this red oxide iron. It's very dense. It's gone from hydrogen into helium. It's going up the periodic table. It's much denser. It's much bigger than this very light object here that we somehow managed in our science to believe that this is super dense because it's made of the lightest atoms. And everything orbits it because it's so heavy because it's made of such light atoms when this thing is made of iron it's spewing iron it's creating much denser atoms that spew from it so we could naturally assume even though it goes against our understanding that the sun's made of the lightest elements so it must be the most densest object which means that everything in the universe is going to want to orbit this super heavy light thing and we've got this super light thing over here that orbits furthest from the earth because it's made of these super heavy elements so it must be very light and far away can you see everything is upside down with our current models everything is a lie you know and it all comes from our christian stories and christian stories is self you know you is a prison that you walk into by a state of belief you know when in the in the in the in the you know these are Christian stories that are thrown to us in the in in the story of the, the the Shakespeare story of the of the Merchant of Venice you know his the Merchant is um, he's he's taken to court by this by this Jewish guy that hates him because he's a Christian and. He loses his court case against him ultimately, and he and now he wanted the Christian's ultimate death. He wanted his pound of flesh to be cut from his body while he was living, which meant that he would thus be dead. But then he found out, as the court case trans kind of went on, that it was if he wanted his pound of flesh, that meant he would actually want to kill him. And it later revealed that he just wanted him dead. He didn't. He didn't want to settle the debt, even though the the the, the Christian could now settle his debt. That wasn't enough. It was just no. I want my pound of flesh. I want to see that guy die. And then he heard that actually, to take your pound of flesh, you weren't allowed to spill one drop of blood. So he was told to take his pound of flesh, but not spill one drop of blood. And it was like, oh, how do I do that? How do you enslave someone and take someone against their will if they're not willing to give themselves up or as if, if they're not willing to, you know, if they can't bleed to death, you can't actually kill them, you can't actually touch them. You know, so, so we, you know, this story's reoccurred. Think about Samson. He wasn't allowed to cut him, touch him, anything. So supposedly we're to told that he had, in Samson's story, we held the blade against his face, but we didn't touch his face. We held it against his eyes and we burnt his eyes out. We blinded him with the sword. 
Then we transferred that we heated the sword up and he put it in, in hot ashes and we held it against his eyes until he was blind. That's how we kind of see that in today's world. But actually, could that be a deeper tale? That they were blinded by the sword when it was put in front of his eyes? You know what I mean? How many people think that they can get to God by fighting? How many people think the same thing? You know, you've done evil, so, you know, an eye for an eye. You know, and Gandhi says, an eye for an eye, we'll all be blind. You know, this kind of same message recurs. We translate it in so many different ways because every, if you believe in Christianity, then you believe in the Bible, but you can see every sentence in the Bible. You can read it in a million different ways. And yet you're all believing something. So we see that belief is blinding. You know, so what did the merchant of Venice, you know, the, the, the Christian, what did, when he was saying, you could, yeah, no, the, 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 this Jewish guy who wants you, wants you dead has lost the court case. So he wanted you dead. So we can throw that on him now. What would you like to do? Kill him. And he's like, I don't, I don't want to kill anyone. I don't want to kill anyone. He said, well, 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 we've got to kill him because he wanted to kill you. And he's, you know, and he's lost his court case. So we've got to kill him. And he's like, I don't want to kill him. So like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, the next best thing then, you can't kill him. What's the next best thing? Take his Jewish status away and make him a Christian. That was his punishment. To be reduced to Christian. To be reduced to living in the belief system. You believe you're special, so you have all these special rights, but these special rights completely shut you down. They make you the enemy of the world because you believe you're special. Look at what we've done now in the story of carbon dioxide. When you believe in carbon dioxide and you want to go to carbon zero, like Extinction Rebellion, it radicalizes you with a belief because you want to believe in something that will kill this world. You want to believe that the carbon dioxide spewing out of the volcanoes and that sort of stuff can only be stopped by building nuclear power stations on fault lines. You will not take away from that. You won't go away from that. Look at all these electric vehicles and that sort of stuff. This is not saving the world. Not until you take CO2 zero. Because how producing a load of electrical cars and then going a load of new nuclear power stations and all the rest of it, that's not going to get us to carbon zero. That's just mass manufacturing. You've all got to go crazy by all these new cars. They're only going to last for three years and the battery's going to need replacing. That's going to cost more than the damage to the environment. There's no, there's no, there's no saviour here. There's no abundant, clean energy vision in this. We look at the sun every day and we see the sun radiating abundant, clean energy, but we cannot, none of us, bring that into our models. And so we come to a situation where, um, come on in. Oh my goodness me. We come to a situation where little puppy says, I want to be on TV. Yeah, you want to be on TV. 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 You big old softy. Oh, you, you big old softy. You big old softy. <laughs> she's all, she's, she's, she's the protector now. She's got a blue scarf on, so she looked a bit masculine. But I do that because she loves going saying hello to everyone. And then, um, and then, um, and she scares the kids a little bit, but she just wants to lick them to death. And um, but as soon as she's got a little scarf around her neck, she looks a little bit more like a teddy bear. They just they they just they, their faces fill with joy and they're like, oh, and then and then they're not so scared. But a, a dog with no collar kind of running towards you is a bit scary sometimes. I think for a little kid, especially if she's a bit like. Woof, 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 woof. Anyway, lovely people, look, I'm waffling on. I think I've covered it all. I've gone totally grey. I've gone white. I've gone white over the last. Literally, all my all my all my dark hairs fell out in one fell swoop. And um, and it's been so stressful seeing this because I wrote this book to say don't do this, and we've done everything, you know. I'm saying once you leave Europe, your fate is sealed. And um, and we've left Europe, and I desperately tried to do everything to try and stop this and to try and show you the nature of what is going to stop World War Three. It's not going to be your depleted uranium bombshells. I'm afraid. There's only one thing that can stop this. You can sort of see what it is, and it's there to save you. 
This is there to save you, just like in 1606, just like in 1859. Yeah, sorry, in 1582. Sorry. You know, you see the same things going on. That, oh, 1588, when the Spanish Armada came in, loaded with all the, all the, loaded with killers. You know, it was just Catholics, Catholic monks on board those ships. The, 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 the troops hadn't got on the ships to be ferried across to the battlefield, which would have been Britain, where every Protestant would have been killed, murdered, just in the most horrible, sadistic ways. You know, there was only monks on board those ships and this storm just came in and blew them all away. And, you know, that's where you see this, you have this kind of idea of sort of Francis Drake, master and commander of the fleet, leading the fleet, going, come on, we're going to take them out before they get to, kind of, before they get up to France and Belgium and ferry all the troops across the border. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to take them out at the bottom. We're going to take them out at battle formation and we're going to use our ships. No ferries, no troops, no inquisition. You know, Bloody Mary had already started the, started the Inquisition and, and her daughter, her, her sister, had basically stopped her. Uh, she died thinking she was pregnant when she had cancer. And Elizabeth, waiting to be executed, was brought down from the tower and made queen. And she, um, she basically tried to reverse the Spanish Inquisition, what uh, Bloody Mary had tried to, had started. You know, tried to reverse everything her father had said about Henry VIII. And, uh, and then she died just unexpectedly with the Catholics thinking they had their new heir that was going to give the justice, stop the Protestant movement. And Bish, she died. Elizabeth was taken to the throne. Elizabeth kind of, you would have thought Elizabeth would, have, would be the one that would have not followed the king, king her, her, her father's kind of footsteps, because it was her mother he um, beheaded. But, um, but, she did, and then the Spanish sent the Armada, and she had John Dee as a kind of, if you like, spiritual advisor, and and uh, Francis Drake was master and master and commander of the fleet, and she had, um, well, she had Francis Bacon as well. You know, that was her. Really, he was protege to. He was, you know, his Francis Drake's protege supposedly was Sir um, John Dee, and um, so. There's our kind of image of Sir Francis Drake, instead of leading the battle, leading the ships to kind of try and take out as many of the Spanish ships as possible. He was playing, he was playing bowls. He was playing bowls, not engaging, not any act of war, because he knew that any act of war, when this thing was flying by, was synonymous, synonymous with suicide. Drawing your enemy in for an attack. See how it was done in the Second World War. See how America became so powerful as a result of the Second World War by not by bringing the war world into a state of war, but um, not engaging until the rest of the world was completely at war and then coming in under special contract. Like, yeah, we'll come in, we'll give you a hand, but you know, you've got to kind of sign the Balfour Agreement, and that just means that Israel belongs to. The West to America, effectively, and that's what Hitler wanted. Remember, Hitler it was the same thing. It was just like, oh, you know, the West is kind of like, um, is um, you know, he had the same kind of thing. He, you know, that he believed, believed the whole Aryan race that they're kind of like we we're all from. It was we, you know, that the, the Europeans were from Iran. That's our homeland. It's just like, oh, okay, here we go. Oh, Hitler's a really bad man. We've got to stop him. Quickly stop him. And we stop him. And then suddenly all the Palestinians are just turfed off their ground. It's just like, oh, well, homeland. <laughs> Sorry. But you said that. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Funny that, isn't it? <laughs> you know, so now you hear the same thing. You hear kind of like, um, you're hearing that the man behind Biden is Obama. And you're seeing this kind of thing where he's on stage. You've seen it. Oh, he calls him Vice President Biden. Obama calls him Vice President Biden on on stage and says it's a joke. Everyone gathers around him and Biden, whether he's choreographed that, I don't know, but he looks like a total idiot. He goes around to say hello to people and there's no one there and he's diddling and everything he opens is diddling. It's like Batman and Robin, isn't it? And it's, it's not Batman and Robin. It's Batman and the old butler guy 
who kind of looks after him. That's the kind of scene that is reminiscent to, isn't it? He's the guy who's kind of like, he's granddad, and he's just the front man for it all. And who started the whole Ukraine thing? It was Obama. Obama started that whole, he started the coup in the Ukraine in 2014. And who invaded Libya in 2011? Took NATO to war with Libya. Who started that in 2011? Scary times, guys. We see a big picture unfolding here, and um, I'm afraid that all your big political leaders, I'm afraid they're all on the same side of the fence. And um, you're all thinking it was Tony Blair was the evil, renegade, left-wing, but now you kind of see the whole left-wing movement is as screwed up as the right-wing movement. And now the right-wing hate the left-wing because of the story of building nuclear power stations on fault lines and the whole carbon zero, massive profit-making thing. They hate them as much as the left wing hates the right wing. And um, and now you have two kind of factions that are You know, there is, you know, you might, like I say, I used to think it was Tony Blair that was the, but now it's a bigger picture, isn't it? Now you realise it's just, we, we either have to evolve this shortfall and change this story. And, but it's very difficult to stop this now. We live a very different situation and a fault line movement under the Atlantic. Well, that's going to have people, you know, the story about, oh, La Palma Caldera could collapse and cause a tsunami. No, nah. that's a local little tsunami. Might a few beaches might get flooded, maybe even a city here and there locally. But a fault line under the, under the Atlantic, right up to the mid-Atlantic rift. That's that's real tsunami material. That's that's something to worry about. So now it's more thinking about not how you can stop this, but where you go after this. Where you go after this. Once you've annihilated your existing home and who wants you who wants a world killer the soul that last soul of imagine if you are one of the last souls that live on this this little story and you know you're a world killer soul let's say someone who incarnated and ruined it for everyone else tried to kill the timeline try to stop humanity in its tracks with depleted uranium and your chronic story of building nuclear power stations on fault lines that is the narrative that we're all given right now the new christian narrative where we've taken christ off the cross and we've stuck the earth on it and we said it's dying because of your sins and you need to embrace nuclear and you need to hate Russia and you need to love depleted uranium and you're good and they're bad sweet Fukushima Chernobyl the invasion of the coup within Ukraine in 2014 the invasion that happened of Libya in 2011, directly after Fukushima, when we were all just reeling with the shock that three, four nuclear power stations had gone into absolute meltdown and that many of our most loved ones were gonna now start dropping dead of the most horrible cancers. We were gonna sweep it all under the carpet and just say, nothing.
painful situation. Painful situation. So we just pretend it's not happening. I go with the narrative that Jesus is going to come. And if we believe in him, he's going to say, don't worry about the depleted uranium. I love you. You're so special. You are. Love you. Love you. Gorgeous, lovely people. And you're depleted uranium. You are special. Because Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. He loves you. He loves depleted uranium. He loves big guns. He loves chieftain tanks. Oh, and he loves the challenges. Oh, he loves those. He loves those javelin rockets. Oh my God, they're so special to him. He thinks, yeah, great. <sighs> what are we gonna do, guys? You're running out of time. And uh, a belief story is just a story to, you know, To bring something else into your heart and for you to make space for that and for you to be upset by that so something else moves into your heart center because you are not worthy because you are evil because you have decided that you are below the gradient that of sustainable existence in this world and in this body you exist in now so you should leave you should be leaving and they should be arriving are you a believer will you be leaving making way for something new you little munchy munch munch ow gently Big time, guys. Big time. I don't know what side of the fence you're all on, but um, yeah, this doesn't get a lot bigger. You have definitely got the gods' attention. You have definitely. When you see the Azores going bang, you know you have the attention of the gods. Take care. All the love in the world. Thank you.